through the pros and cons of different methods. So let's start with landmark displacements. Um, to study shape, uh, you need to remove size, position and orientation and this is done via a Procrustes superimposition uh, which achieves the best fit via a least squares criterion um, and this provides the link to the theory of Kendall's shape space. Now, um, the generalized Procrustes superimposition algorithm goes as following. So it's an iterative process which fits each configuration to the mean shape as closely as possible. Size variation is removed by rescaling to a centroid size of one, um, and then variation of the position is removed by aligning all the centers of gravity um, of all the different configurations. Um, and then you've got rotations to find the best, um, uh, best orientation, I suppose. Um, and then in the first round, so all wings are aligned using the first specimen um, using the least squares procrustes. So this minimizes the sum of the square distances between the landmarks of the target um, and the sort of original common shape. Um, after you've finished aligning all the wings, you get the average shape from all the aligned configurations. And then you rescale each configuration to get a centroid size uh, of an average shape, um, of, of the average shape uh, is one. Um, and then you go into round two, the average shape is the new sort of consensus wing, and each configuration is then fitted around that new consensus wing. A new average is obtained and then so on. So you repeat round two until the average no longer uh, significantly changes um, this often requires like two or three rounds at most. Um, now, just a quick, quick um, definition. Centroid size is a measure of size uh, quantifying the spread of landmarks around their centroid or center of gravity. There are some issues with the, the Procrustes fit uh, landmark plot. So if you plot all the landmarks uh, that are superimposed, um, it doesn't take into account uh, any group structure, so there's no guarantee that you'll see group differences, uh, even if they exist. So for that, it's better to use discriminant analysis or canonical variant analysis, which does focus on the differences between groups. Um, it doesn't show um, the covariation among landmarks, um, so. Klingenberg really doesn't re recommend to use landmark superimposition plots to show data um, in any formal publications. Um, an issue with the least squares Procrustes superimposition algorithm is the Pinocchio effect. Um, so this is a case where you've got variation that's extremely localized to a small region uh, or even a single landmark um, and what what happens is that the uh, the algorithm spreads out the variation from landmarks with greater variation to landmarks with less variation. Um, so to counter this, Chapman suggests a resistant fit superimposition instead of the least squares Procrustes superimposition um, to deal with this very problem. Um, it's quite it, it can happen that distal wing shows greater variation than the wing base um, just because the uh, variation present at any one landmark depends on all other landmarks. Um, so amounts of variation of positions of individual landmarks is not attributable to those landmarks on their own, but result from the superimposition of entire configurations. Um, that said, several landmarks have very clear directionality um, which tend to line up with uh, anatomical features uh, such as veins, so you'll see some of the axes of PCA that will line up with a vein. Um, this suggests that shape variation is integrated, that there's, um, which means that shape variation is concentrated in certain directions but not in others. Um, and Oh, and one thing that we should probably be careful about, um, when we say landmark shift, there is in fact no uh, landmark, strictly speaking, moving. There's not floating about in space, but instead it's the tissue between the landmarks that is changing.
there is one big bias in the perception that we have. We, we seem to apply a parsimony criterion when we describe changes. Um, that is, we, we like seeing and describing the smallest number of landmarks change. So um, take, for instance, um, Pinocchio's head. Um, so if you digitize all of Pinocchio's head and the nose, we tend to see the head as being fixed and the nose as moving rather than uh, having one landmark fixed and all the others changing. So in this case, it would be having the nose fixed and the rest of the head moves backwards. Um, so yeah, it's quite a big bias and we have to be careful when interpreting um, the changes in shape. I'll now come on to um, another visualization method, um, which is arrows, lollipops and wireframes, quite a catchy title. Um, lollipops are quite a simple form of visualization, but by themselves they're quite difficult to relate to anatomy. So this can be solved by um, superimposing either sort of a wireframe graph, so that's simply lines that connect up uh, relevant landmarks, um, or you can superimpose outline drawings which um, are warped using thin plate spline according to the information um, of the landmark. So that's um, an even more, uh, I suppose, biologically correct, but you are effectively making up data between the landmarks. So to be debated between landmarks. Um, more recently, um, thanks to the advances in computing uh, technology, when you're dealing with 3D shape changes, um, it's, you can use uh, heat maps. So bulges from the starting uh, configuration are uh, in warm colors, whilst any sort of uh, receding or negative bulges are, are described in using co cold colors. Um, the distance between the closest points uh, of each uh, surface corresponds to the displacement vectors in 3D. Um, and finally, we'll come on to the transformation grids of Darcy Thompson. Um, so thin plate spline is an interpolation technique which is both flexible and mathematically rigorous. It guarantees that there's a corresponding point corresponding points in both the starting and the target forms um, and they, they appear precisely in corresponding positions in the grids. Um, this is not a given if you draw it by hand or with using some other computational methods. Um, the interpolation provides the smoothest possible transformation, uh, so minimizing the second derivatives. And it's named after the metaphor of an infinitely thin and infinitely large metal plate and the relative notion of uh, bending energy because the metal plate resists abrupt bending uh, so it would need more more bending energy to, to have abrupt uh, edges. Um, another desirable property um, is that change diminishes towards the margins. Now there are some caveats to transformation grids. Um, the minimizing of the uh, bending energy is a nice metaphor, but doesn't represent any biological phenomenon. There's no, well, there's usually no direct equivalent of uh, smooth elastic deformation in biological systems. Instead, it's just a, a, a an imagined aid for visualization, purely purely made up data points between the landmarks. So you have to be really cautious. Um, when you're interpreting uh, changes when there are very few landmarks or when you're very far from the landmarks. The grid orientation can make the same changes look very different. Um, so you sort of do need to have the original starting grid uh, and the finished target grid. Um, similarly for grid mesh, you can also make um, things, the same changes look very different if there are few or no lines that pass through the region of greatest change, then you are missing a lot of information. Um, and then if you've just got pure lines, it's very difficult to interpret because there's no uh, anatomical info to refer to. So it's better to add an outline or a surface, uh, for example, the digitized skulls uh, example that's in the original paper. Um, but you have to be careful whether there are um, few or 
few landmarks and it's maybe not appropriate to draw structures that have absolutely no landmarks at all so for instance um, drawing the beak of a bird if no landmarks on the beak have been digitized um, there's also um, as I mentioned earlier there's um, the thin plate spline guarantees the corresponding points um, on, on both grids but this assumption of continuous deformation can be violated um, if the landmarks converge towards one another. The method is okay as long as there is st still some uh, distance between them. The uh, problem is when multiple landmarks shift uh, to a single point or diverge from a single point, um, it creates um, well, in the first case, it's sort of, you've got multiple points in one location. Um, so the one-to-one -one correspondence is difficult to establish. Um, and in the case of diverging, then it creates a sort of uh, hole between the landmarks um, in the one-to-one -one correspondence grid. Um, so for example, like fontanelles um, in, in the brain so close in many mammals, so you would lose a lot of the landmarks along them. Um, another problem is if a portion of the landmark configurations uh, flips over, then you've got a transformation grid that folds over. Um, and then another issue is the uh, switching of positions among nearby landmarks. For example, a cranial uh, foramen can appear on either side of the suture. Um, so yeah, that's all for today.